like everything that you presented at the beginning of this, that you really upheld everything that you said you were going to do. Absolutely. Just, you do. Yeah. You're disillusioned. And I love huh? you. You're disillusioned. You know, you can't control other people's actions. Like, uh, John, but you the have day been, that we you were have there. You have been controlling everybody's actions. <laughs> oh, well, you have been controlling everybody's actions. Don't push me. You have been, you have been controlling everybody's actions. Oh, ah. Don't hey, push. Hey, 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 don't push. Hey, you push me first. Don't push. Hey, hey stop. stop. You know, he, he truly is who he is, you know, whether you like him or not. A mean, violent. Pisses a lot of people off, and a lot of people hate him. Intimidating, relentless. You know, he, he's, he's an elephant in a china shop at times. Yes. Oh, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you did that. Gigi, I said that. I have I can't believe you did that. Why would you do that? Why would you hit me in my head like that? You grabbed my neck and you almost broke my fucking neck. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? He's not just difficult to everybody around him at times. He's difficult to his own self. I would go so far to say is sometimes he could be his own worst enemy. You just lied just then. In front of everybody right here, you lied. How could you be that twisted to not know what happened two seconds ago? Drop it or it's going to go somewhere you don't want to go. Oh, is that, that you're, now you're threatening No, me. I'm just saying. Okay, so now it's on film, you're threatening me. That, that's what you're doing now? It's this gonna is, go someplace, it's stupid. gonna go. This is stupid. Yeah, it is. Well, but... Wow. Really? Yeah. I think what I would say about Sam as of right now, that he is God's man for the hour. say that you're a missionary or are you a mercenary? I will accept it either way. Radio experience. Sam Childers joins us. Uh, he's been on this program numerous times, and we, we try to help him, the machine gun preacher. Tell me the scene. I mean, I've read your book, and, I, and you and I are old friends. What is the scene when you go and you got your Bible, you got your gun or your machine, your, your handgun or your machine gun, and, and what kind of environment are you going into? I'm not sure I want to arm wrestle this guy anymore. <laughs> no, you, you've already made the bet. You've already made the bet. Have you killed you. people? God, yeah, we fought all through here. Me and this man here. This man here, too. This man here, too. You, you've killed. I mean, that's pretty much, if we're reading... I've been in a lot of gunfights. Okay. Should a man of God be killing? I mean, it, it, turn the other cheek. One of the top ten, You right? know, you're... Thou shalt not kill. No, it says thou shalt not murder. And if somebody don't want to consider me as a pastor, that's fine, okay? I'm yep. a lover of Jesus Christ. 
But I ask everybody all yeah. the time, if you have a child, somebody yeah. took your child, yeah. and I said, I can rescue your child, what would you say? Oh, I kill, kill every last one of them. All right, that's kill, what kill I do, is I rescue children. Sam got word that uh, there were 15 or so children that were uh, found in the bush, so we decided to leave very early that morning. And you know, it was it, 2008. It was still really dodgy. Uh, you know, there were ambushes. There'd been an ambush an hour away, and by the LRA. And you know, I always remember Sam saying, "Hey, man, here's here's a pump, here's a pump action shotgun. Anything happens, just go in a ditch and shoot anything that moves, man." <laughs> I was like, "Okay." One question that I even asked him is, how do you know that you haven't shot a child in all the time that you're there? The people that are shooting at you, trying to kill you, might actually be the people that you're trying to save. Marco, no! Marco! Don't fire that thing! There's kids behind the truck! Do you lose kids uh, getting them out of the village? Do they, no, do they I, have, I have never had a child ever killed wow. in a rescue. And right. I've, I've seen a lot of children that were dead, but I've never had a child killed in a rescue. There was a lot of confusion. It's, it's, it's not as organized as one thinks because you have to make sure that the kids are really the kids that, you know, are orphans in the bush. And because every parent wants to send their kid to Sam's orphanage because, you know, Sam's orphanage is three meals a day, uh, education, uh, clean. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a life that they, doesn't exist in, in a normal Sudanese village. This one is one. Oh, uh, this one is not. Yeah, we need the names and the tribe. Okay. So there's ten. Okay. We're only taking children. It got very tense, and Deng had to sort of take over, you know, Sam and Deng had to take over the situation and calm the elders. People kept crowding in and trying to give their kids. One more. No, we are taking them now. This is okay, just too small. I'm saying they, they are going to bring them here separately. Everybody has to go back. Yeah, okay. Where, where are the ones we're taking? You put them in the back of the truck one by one, then. You put them in the back of the truck one by one. Don't go this one down. Down. He's too big. He's too big. You down. Ah, down. Guys, guys, dude. He's too big. What is it? This one is too big, man. Marco. This one. Okay, how many we have? These children that I just threw in the back, you can look at them. The boy is sick. Marco, come on! So nice. I feel so good. Yeah. I'll never forget when we did that Fox TV show. Yeah. And there were uh, there were we had prostitutes and pimps and drug addicts and Ron had, Jeremy and Ron Jeremy's there. Yeah. And, and he and you know he, this is a preacher <clears throat> and he fit he fit in with him because that's your background, right? Yeah. Uh, used to used to deal drugs. Used to be a bad hombre. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Uh, you had a, a, a transformation in your life, and now you rescue. Uh, kidnap children and you do it with a gun in one hand and a Bible in the other. Gerard Butler is playing him in a movie. We're going to spend some more time with him. Plus your calls next at one 888 2 We'll be back. He was a, a very good uh, little boy. 
and always uh, curious about different things. He did real well in school. He was a ha very happy child. We'd be running around in these woods and climbing trees and climbing up hills and rolling down hills and playing army and yeah, we had a good time as kids. We was always out in the country and stuff and we was brought up well. I went to church a lot, would go Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings, Wednesday nights. The first bike, it was a brand new Honda, a little Honda. And here he was going pretty fast and he hit the bridge down here. And it knocked him out. You know, I can actually say I was brought up in, in one of the perfect families. I had a good mom, I had a good dad, Christian, both of them. My dad was half Cherokee Indian, so we'd always go to Indian powwows. And I remember one of the first ones my mom took me to, I was like five, six years old. She took me to an Indian powwow dressed up as a cowboy. Boots and all. The only cowboy here among the Indians. I even made it in the front page of the newspaper, but I always teased my mom. That's how I ended up so mean. You dress your kid up like a cowboy and take him to an Indian powwow. That's, that's not a good idea. I thought everything was good. We all would get ornery and we'd uh, get in a little bit of trouble here and there, but nothing real serious. I guess when we got a little bit older in the teens is when we started doing different things that we shouldn't have been doing. First time I met Sam, I was terrified. I thought I was going to die. I was terrified. He was 15 years old and them 30 year old or 25 year old guys did not mess with any of us if Sam was around. He was a fighter. Yeah, he liked to fight. And then he started, uh, he liked guns. And he always had a sawed off shotgun with him. I mean, a couple times he pulled it out, but I mean, if he was at a party, he would, he'd have it and he'd be blasting bullets and, you know, raising cane and. We were living in uh, Minnesota when he was uh, became uh, very rebellious. After he was 16, I um, found out more about the drugs, and I figured that was what was making him uh, ugly toward us. We were pretty tight-knit, and we skipped school all the time, and we hung out in Scott Wagner's basement, played cards, and smoked pot. Sam always had pot. You'd have big parties, outside parties, and everybody would be doing uh, different things. You'd be doing acid, you'd be doing coke, you'd be doing speed, uh, stuff like that, and uh, we dabbled in all of it. I don't know if this is good or not, showing people this. I only really did the needle thing <laughs> once in my entire life, but it was Sam who, who shot it up into me. And we only had one needle. <laughs> and I, rem I just remember it was me, I, it was me, Scott, Lynn, and, and Sam. You're hiding something from me, aren't you? <laughs> I think there's something that, missing, Sam. There is something missing, I think. I think there is. Did you get the one in the back here? Yeah, I got it. Faith's is missing. Huh? Faith. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Missing. Grab the other one. I knew there was one missing. Can't have, can't do nothing without the main one. This is the most important one. Yeah. Just ain't right. Now we're ready. Now we're ready. Take on anything. Anything. You gonna pull out your ammo boxes? No, can't show them everything, then we have to shoot them. <laughs> That's true. That's true.
I ended up moving to Florida. I got ended up getting married, moved to Florida, and then uh, about oh maybe a year later, he followed followed me down there, and uh, we worked out in the orange groves picking oranges. So Sam went down there too, but I think that made him worse because he, he got involved. There, there's so much more in a bigger uh, city to get involved in. Florida was a big party place, so uh, drugs were easy to get down there and stuff like that. And when you was drinking and uh, doing drugs and that, and then you'd go out into bars and stuff like that. There, we got into a lot of different situations there that uh, wasn't good, a few shootouts here and there. I was 21 when I met Sam. He was 18. It was Daytona Beach Bike Week, and we were headed to the beach. I was with a friend of his. So this motorcycle come up beside of us, and it was a guy that we knew, and he wanted to buy some drugs. So we roll up a joint, we're sitting there talking. We'll hear the, the girl that got into the van that was with him was Lynn. It was all over right there. He was uh, the cutest thing I'd ever laid my eyes on. He's sitting in this big old chair, and he had his big old bushy hair and his big long beard, and he didn't even have a shirt on. And I looked at him, I said, I'm gonna marry that man someday. A week, two weeks later, he showed up at my job. I was a stripper, I, I was at a strip joint, and we went and bought some cocaine, and we went for like a whole week just doing cocaine and acid and getting to know one another. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> they was all respectable when they come around us. But I found out later that they was bad boys. They was terrible boys. It's loaded. Oh, you want me to give the baby? Oh, thumbs? yeah, but there ain't there ain't one in the sh in the Thank chamber. Thank you. Just there's some in the club. Let me give oh, let me okay. give the baby thumbs. Well, this one not for me. <laughs> <laughs> we was happy that he was still alive because I know he was involved in a lot of things that his life could have been taken. There was a lot of people up there would like to kill him in Minneapolis because he used to uh, run drugs from Minneapolis up north and uh, the money never returned to the city. The way I understand, there's still a few people in Minneapolis who would kill him right now. He was uh, just a shaggy-headed uh, brawler, fist fighter, motorcycle rider, gang member. Uh, had done everything that you could possibly, the illegal and wrong, uh, shooting people, causing brawls, uh, Stealing. Used to drink yeah, with Hilsey. See, you can see the big specs. With this guy. Oh, okay. I think I even smoked a few joints with him. Probably. <laughs> oh, that was last week. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was Easter Sunday. <laughs> I mean, I first met him, I didn't like the guy. I thought he was. I thought somebody ought to take him outside and shoot him, but that's how rough he used to be. You didn't. You didn't double cross him, I'll put it to you that way. Uh, Really, nobody ever gave them any grief or anything. They were just scared to death of Sam. It's for people that aren't happy. It can either make them happy or solve problems. Sam didn't know when to stop. I mean, when he when he'd he get into a confrontation with somebody, it would he would fight you until you wasn't moving. Pretty much moving. You ever see one of these? It's a wife listener. The wife will listen. He got in trouble. He was in uh, jail, and it was on Mother's Day. I will never forget that. First thing I said to him, I said, uh, well, Sam, th thank you for the wonderful Mother's Day gift. <laughs> Come here. Stop that. Get over here. <laughs> Come on. Come touch me. <laughs> 
I would say probably if I wouldn't have said to Sam or Joe or whoever was with us there, let's go, let's get out of here, uh, Sam probably would have been in prison to, to this day. <laughs> you don't trust me? Come on, aren't we friends? We were going from one bar to the next. It just seemed like Sam was always fighting. Um, yeah, I was getting bad at that time. Now this is my baby in here. Now listen, your knees are gonna shake. You'll probably even get a little aroused. We were kids, I was 19. As in the first year that I got to Florida, I was 19 years old. And this fight started and I was like in shock that this guy was on top of Sam. Wow. I'm telling you, man. This would get anybody in the mood. All of us ended up outside. The whole bar came outside. And Sam was getting beat up pretty bad. And they asked me, he said, throw me the gun, throw me the gun. This is the only thing. My wife don't get jealous of anything, any woman at all around me. The only thing she gets jealous of is this bike. <laughs> She sees me out here stroking it and putting oil on it. She'll say, why don't you do that to me? All of a sudden, we heard guns. We got, I got guns, and all of a sudden, everybody just started shooting. And you could hear the bullets whizzing by your head and stuff like that. And we get about two blocks down the road, and there were state troopers crossways in the road, doors open, guns out their windows and the whole works. I do know that she was arrested and for some reason Sam, I think from what I heard, he didn't get arrested. I don't know why, maybe he ran, but uh, that seems to be the way he got out of most of his problems was to run. <laughs> And finally, one day I told my wife, Lynn, I said, I said, we got to get out of here or somebody's going to kill me. So we moved from Orlando, Florida, up to Pennsylvania, and it was the best move I ever made in my life because uh, the drugs and the wild uh, life living was not there like it was down in Orlando. Come on, Sam. Do you I'm not riding bitch. I'm not riding bitch. Yeah, Sam. You be my bitch, Sam. I ain't gonna ride bitch, brother, man. Yeah, it is. Sam and Lynn got married before they came up here because they wanted to know if they could stay with us till they got their my little house built. And we said, yes, but you would have to be married or you'd have to sleep in separate rooms. We were strict with them, but that, that gets them on the right track. You know what, it was really the greatest thing for me is just having Peter Fonda out here. I mean, come on, the guy is the king of the biker world. You know, I mean, he's, he's, the, he's the main, he's the easy rider. He had just started a construction business with Clyde Carter. And Clyde told him that if he married me before the end of the year, he would get a tax cut. And so Sam came and asked me, he said, hey, if, I get, if we get married before the end of the year, we get a tax cut and I can save money and blah, 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 the taxes. And, and I says, all right. So we did. We went and got married so he'd get a tax cut on, his, on his, the business with Clyde. So that's when the change began. My, my wife started going to church with my mom. Uh, next thing I know, my wife is not drinking, she's not doing drugs, and she's praying for me. And, you know, I thought I had problems in the past, but I'm going to tell you something. Somebody starts praying for you seriously, you got a problem if you're not ready to change. He was very mean. He was jealous of my walk with God, I think. So I didn't invite him until the missionary from Africa came. And that's when I invited him to come because it was like, this man is crazy. You need to meet him. You think you're crazy, wait till you meet Sam. <laughs> so that's when I invited him to church. Whew. Changed Sam's life from that point on. But Sam was all fidgety. He was like sweating really bad and Sam knew at that point that God was calling him because Sam always knew he had a call on his life. He always knew that Sam was to be different than what he had created. And he was running from God. And when Michael Howard 
told him, what are you doing sitting back here? God has a call on you. Sam broke because Sam knew that he was right. And that was the greatest beginning in his life, better than whenever he was born, because that was, he was born again with Christ. I remember that night I said the sinner's prayer there. And when I left there, it was like there was something burning in me that I wanted more. So I went back the very next night, that night when he gave the altar call, I was the first one there. And I'll never forget, when I went up to the altar, this preacher from South Africa started prophesying over me. And he said, I was going to Africa, and I was going to be in a war. And uh, I remember from that point, I was just blocking everything out, because the last thing I was going to do was go to Africa. And I remember as he's prophesying, I'm saying, this ain't true. Then people got their self in a mess over there. I'm not going to go over there and help them. So anyways, I'm standing outside. I figure, well, when this preacher comes through the door, I'm going to curse him out, and then I'm going to punch him in the face. So he comes through, and I mean, I'm, I'm hollering, I'm shouting, I'm cursing, I'm telling him, don't tell me I'm going to Africa. I'm not going to go help them people. But he just stood there and smiling at me, and he looks at me, and all he would say was, we'll see. Well, anyways, a number of years ago, 13 years ago in Sudan, the Africans there started calling me the machine gun preacher. I started an orphanage with a mosquito net hanging from a tree, and I'm not going to lie to you, you needed a machine gun. People say, no, no, I just went out there with prayer. I would have buried you then. If you just went there with your Bible, I would have buried you. Sudan is Africa's largest country in geographical terms and has a population of around 40 million. Since Sudan's modern borders were drawn up by the British last century, it has been very much a country of two halves. The south is more suited to farming thanks to its wetter climate, whereas the north is sparsely vegetated or desert. Tribal and religious divisions have also highlighted the north-south split. Christian and animist South Sudan had little in common with the Arabic Muslim north. In a long civil war between the two halves of the country, which only ended in 2005, around two million people, mostly southerners, were killed, and millions more made homeless. The discovery of oil in the south in the 1980s transformed the economy of the entire country. The oil is piped north through Khartoum to Port Sudan for export. Oil production has risen from a trickle in 1999, when exports first began, to a 490,000 barrel a day industry today. This has been reflected in the country's export revenues, of which oil now makes up 94%. However, most of this new wealth has flowed only to Khartoum in the center of the country, adding to the resentment of the regions against the ruling elite. Well, first time Sam came to Africa, my father picked him up from the airport. Um, we had a mutual friend, and I mean, I can only imagine what my my dad thought of this um, little grizzly bear-looking man. <laughs> well, first time I met Sam at the airport in Entebbe in 1998, when he came uh, to Uganda and then en route to um, Sudan, yay, to put up a roof on a very big building. And uh, I admired the way he, he handled people and when we went even to, to yay, the way he really managed to organize the work to put on the roof. I mean, you could see he's like an army general in, a, in some kind of way, but, in a, but, but with a very tender heart. I remember when the trip was almost over, I seen a body of a small child that from the waist down on the body was gone. There was just nothing there.
And I remember I stood over that child and, and I didn't realize what I was saying or what kind of a commitment that I was making. But I remember I said, God, whatever I need to do to help these people, I'm going to do. When Sam came back from Africa, the business wasn't the same anymore. It was like you, he would go to work, he would, he would, you know, give it his best, but you could tell even on the job that it wasn't the same. It was still, his heart was in Africa. It was all over his face. There'd be $50,000 worth of guns sitting in a gun cabinet. And all I could think of was the children that were starving. I had a bass fishing boat. I couldn't even get in the boat anymore. I had all these toys, all these things of luxury and recreation, and I couldn't even use them anymore. I was done. I, I just, I, saw, I started selling everything. It broke him. It broke all that, what Sam had built up, the walls that Sam had built up. It took that to break that down so God could really get a hold of him. So I went back into Sudan, it would have been like three months after my first trip, I went back into Sudan and I started helping and started supporting the people pulling landmines out. It was uh, mainly the SPLA soldiers. You would find them all throughout the front in the Yay area and stuff pulling the landmines out and I just began to support them. I mean, they were there on nothing, working to save children and save all of the civilians that they could. Soldiers were actually in these trenches. Not much food. A lot of the soldiers were actually going uh, hungry. You can see there's a lot of a lot of things left behind. A lot of uh, old bullets, bomb shells. Not far from here, just a few meters over there in the woods, is all plumb full of landmines. You can't even walk over in there. But this this whole area right here was all a battlefield. All of this was a battlefield. <laughs> Sam stuttered. I don't know whether that's been, you've heard this or not, but Sam was, he stuttered badly. And uh, so he was stuttering when he was telling me this. He said, I'm going to Pennsylvania and build a church. I said, Sam, I don't believe I can help you. I'm sorry, I just don't think I can help you. Because I knew Sam's past, I knew what he was doing, and I was very concerned about that he had, frankly, I thought he had a new, new deal, a new scam. It was a religious scam. Daisy, Sam's mother, told me that Sam's opening up his church where it's at now, and she told me, come on down. Well, I went to his church, and, and I've been going there ever since. How you doing there, bud? <laughs> What's the matter with you? Huh? You're tired. So I came up, and I came to one of the services, and it was real. Sam was preaching. He wasn't stuttering. And I asked him, I said, Sam, when did, when did you stop stuttering? He said, I stopped stuttering the day that I got on my knees and allowed God to do what he had asked me to do. And I found that to be remarkable. And then as time went on, I knew there was more. There had to be something more. And then God moved on me to do a mobile clinic. I needed 30, I think it was $36,000, and I raised like 2,000. I had like three weeks, four weeks to go. And a man called me up and he said, I'll never forget this. He said, God told me to give you whatever you need uh, as a balance for that mobile clinic. Run the mobile clinic for a few years, and what we would do is we'd go into the remote areas. Back then there was fighting everywhere, mile 40, into uh, on the other side of Ye. I mean, you'd get into areas where there was no automobiles, no wells, people drank from uh, mud holes, people drank from the rivers. If the river was there, you know, if, if it wasn't uh, rainy season, if it was dry season, there was no river. We sewed up people from bullet wounds to, 
to setting legs to just about everything you can imagine. I seen men that were fighting for their country that was barefooted. Some of them didn't even have sandals. I seen men that were fighting for their country that had nothing but rags for a uniform. I seen men fighting for their country that only had two, three, sometimes five bullets in their gun. When I seen all of that, I knew the people I was going to help was the SPLA. So Sam went to Naibasha and he met with the, our hero, the peacemaker, Dr. John Grant. And uh, I'm sorry because it is uh, the late Dr. John and we really love this man. John Garang was a soldier first and foremost. He spent more than 20 years at the head of the Sudan People's Liberation Army. He kept what became the SPLA together through turbulent times. And when the conflict which claimed nearly two million lives ended, Garang was appointed Sudan's first vice president. But he lasted just three weeks. A mysterious helicopter crash in 2005, claiming his life and plunging the peace process into new uncertainty. Well, then I went to the other side of Sudan. From the Ye area, would have been over into the Nimali area because I kept hearing about all of these attacks from the Lord Resistant Army. All this was a result of a madman called Joseph Kony and his men who basically waged a campaign of utter fear. I'm not guilty. Uh, I'm not guilty. I'm a freedom fighter who is fighting for freedom. He's a rebel leader whose army comes in the night to kidnap children. They have stolen tens of thousands. The government of Uganda wants to stop him. But here's the problem. Many of the rebel soldiers the government would fight are the very children he stole. It normally was really very, very, very bad before that time. When Sam was there, it normally was a lot of killing around because of the LRA. My very first trip in, I seen an ambush along the road going from Gulu into Nimali, Sudan. Uh, Peter was on the roof of the truck. The bullet hit the, the, the screen and I shoot on the side. And Sam was driving on one, ha one hand and he was shooting the AKM-47 on the other hand. The, 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 the LRA, they were fighting, they have no agenda, they have no objective, what they are doing. They are only looting and killing people, raping children. In the evening hours, we start to wonder where our children are, and we're worried if they're on the street. Well, imagine being living in a country that is so much terror that you will send your children into the streets for safety. When it starts, to, just starting to get dark in the evening, the children will come walking into town, and then they will sleep on the streets. They'll uh, sleep under the porches. And then in the early morning, when it just starts to get daylight, they'll walk back to their village. You have to be very careful in these areas. You don't know who would be trying to, to stop you on the road. Uh, sometimes you might think you're stopping to help a child. But it's really a child of the LRA. I met a, a little boy named Walter, who is a you know beautiful, brilliant, little boy um, who has no eye because the LRA shot him in the face. Those that didn't have the scars on their bodies, you could see it in their eyes. Those eyes haunt me, I have to say. And I think about them. These children saw their family, their parents be killed. And Sam has taken them into his home as his own children. And these are the brightest, most loving, beautiful children. So, sorry. 
You can see a little bit there. Oh my goodness. And uh, the, the doctors at Children's Hospital, uh, they said that she is a living miracle. They said that even they found bullet fragments in the neck. Oh they my. said that she should not even be walking. Look, right now, a good and evil, a big battle, big yeah. battle is brewing. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the army of Mordor, if I can use the Lord of the Rings uh, reference, is happening. It's coming out of the Middle East, that hatred. But you got to remember, Joseph Coney is not the big problem. The big problem is Bashir. Bashir is the president of northern Sudan. He is the one that is fueling and, fin and, and excuse me, financing all of these warlords to kill people. Today... Pre-trial Chamber 1 of the International Criminal Court issued a warrant of arrest for the arrest of Omar Hassan Hamad al-Bashir, the President of Sudan, for war crimes and crimes against humanity. His victims are the very civilian that he, as a president, was supposed to protect like Slobodan Milosevic or Charles Taylor, Omar al-Bashir's destiny is to face justice. The end of 2000, I'm driving outside of Nimli in the bush, and I can still remember that day like it was yesterday. As we were driving through the bush, it was like God said, stop, right here. And I remember I got out of the vehicle and I grabbed my gun and, and I started walking, just kind of walking around the vehicle. And I remember he said very clearly, I want you to start the children's village right here. And so when he told me that he wanted to go to Africa and build the orphanage, I decided, okay, let's do it. So then that's when we decided to sell the business. Then he started traveling and preaching to raise money to help, you know, pretty much Africa. And then I realized, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> I remember I started clearing a spot and started building there the very next day and even people from the government came out and they said, Reverend, the LRA, the rebels are going to kill you on this land. You need to be closer to town. And, and I'll never forget, I told the one man there from the government, I said, you know what, I agree with you. I agree 100%. And I said, uh, but God said this is where he wants the children's village. And uh, as time went on, we started building. First, we built a couple tukus, and then it went from tukus to building a dormitory, and then from building a dormitory to building the church. When we first started over there, it was bad because when he took me over there, they bombed us. I was there when they were bombing. At that time where the orphanage was, uh, it, it was like the LRA heaven. I mean, they were running through there, hiding in the bush, fighting, killing people. There's fighting going on in the flats. There's some more. You could hear that one, did you hear that? I think the name says it all. The, when you look at the name Nimili, that's an Arabic name, and when it's translated over to English, it means, why would you come here? Uh, it's a rough town, um, you know, very third world. It's just tough to live there. It's tough to make a living there. Once you drive into, past the border uh, and you're in Sudan, then you come to the orphanage, and it's a huge, huge compound with big fences and a lot of armed guards with AK-47s. You know, they're not like your special forces, you know, 220 pound kind of guys, you know, who you think are, 
We're gonna get you out of these guys are just, you know, warriors. Are you okay? I'm okay. Uh, Thank who's, you. who's winning? Yeah. 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 You see the surround that you see in the movie, you see that wire fence. So it's serious, I mean it's quiet there right now but there's always, you know, an imminent threat. We were very safe in a very unsafe environment. <laughs> How are you? Man, how are you? This one is the fat one. She's the fat one. She tries to tell me I'm fat, but I said she's fat. She's coming very big. Rembrandt, I think Rembrandt is doing is doing good job. Nice. Darling. I love him. They're so connected and they're so unified and they depend on each other. And they get that from a relationship, from the relationship of God that they have. They've had so much suffering, they've done without for so much. It's just like a huge family. They're secure and you can see that they have kind of a more peaceful feeling about them because they know that they're getting food and water and there's love and, and compassion there. And it sounds funny, but you really do feel it when you see the kids. We actually had a time about between almost six years ago now that everything was falling apart. Lynn had a truck and being they couldn't make the payments on it, they came and um, confiscated the truck and they were cutting her power off. We didn't pay for a lot of things. My mom saved me a lot from my lights being shut off, my phone, my truck was repossessed. I remember going into Sudan on one-way tickets. I would fly from America into Africa on a one-way ticket. I would clean out my entire bank account, and sometimes it'd only be $3,000, $5,000, and go over, not realizing how I was gonna get home or anything. And so many times, you know, I got to say this for the, the faithful people that has supported me in the past. I remember being in Africa and there'd be no money at all. It's looking like you're close to 50%. This one also is an orphan. Orphan there? Yeah. And before you know it, uh, I, I remember I come back from Africa one trip and my wife said, sit down at the table. She said, we got a problem. We're foreclosing on the house. Yeah, also this one is orphan. Yeah, the father also died. Okay. I asked her, I said, how much money we got? And she said, 2,000 some dollars. And I remember looking at her and I said, I got to send it to Africa. And she said, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do that? And I said, yeah. Right now it's about 50%, you know, out of all the children yeah. they're finding. Yeah. But then the other 50%, they still lost either one or the other of their yeah. parent, either the father or the mother. And the only way that they're able to really survive out here is just by coming and hanging out in the market. Yeah. 
and just getting whatever little bit of food they can get for the day just to just to survive. I worried that Lynn would be a widow any day. I mean, because when he left to go over there, we never knew if he was ever coming back. These people are literally getting drinking water out of here, right here. They're getting the water for bathing, drinking, and, and whatever. Yeah, yeah this is, you can see, this, this is totally unbelievable. I mean, people, I mean, most people in America would say this was staged. I knew he was a macho guy. Uh, I knew that he wasn't trying to play a part. I knew that was Sam. What I saw, that's what Sam was. But in my own mind, I thought, well, this guy's trying to be Rambo. I mean, I, I, honestly, I felt that. She's cleaning within the market floor, and then what she cleans up, she will actually take home and sort through it, and that's what they will feed the people with. And she will uh, feed her children and make something to eat out of that. How many children does she feed? Does she feed many children? <laughs> she has a children within, she living within here, within a market with the children because they don't have where to stay. So in case dying with the children, that's why she come to the market to collect from the ground to let her survive as well. Hmm. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. This is really the stuff that we seen in the market where they're sweeping up off the ground. It's really probably more dirt than it is food. Everything in my life was falling apart. I was losing everything. We had no money. Uh, I literally lost my wife. I lost my son. Wayne was living with my first husband, his dad. He didn't come to live with us till he was about 15, 16 years old. The autopsy showed that he had three or four different things in his body at the same time. Sam had a ticket to go to Africa. He left her standing in her son's coffin. Probably a month later, I flew back from Sudan. And when I got to the house and I walked in, she was totally like she wasn't even there. And for several months or several weeks went by and I knew that she totally snapped inside. I was to the point of, I was done. And my Bible was laying there and I couldn't open the Bible. She was lost. There was nothing there. When you'd look in the face, there was nothing there. She was, she was put to the wall and um, uh, there were a, a time, there was a time or two that we didn't know if Lynn was going to make it through it or not. I remember I said, well, I'm going back to Africa. And she said, that's good. That's good. I don't love you no more. And there was a few times that I would leave here one particular time. I left here and I did not plan on coming back. I literally, I remember when I got into Sudan, I'd done every crazy thing you could think of to be killed. Before I left, I checked on my insurance, made sure that if something happened to me that my insurance would pay. But I mean, I had no thoughts in coming back. I figured, you know what, maybe the way to to end this whole thing is just to go there and just stay in the front line, stay in the battle, stay in the, in the in, right in the midst of all the turmoil and all the fighting. 
dad was over there doing his thing, but it seemed like we kept having to send the money and all the horrible things was happening, so I just felt like he didn't care or something. She said to me, Dad, I hate you. She says, you love those children in Africa more than you love me. Dad and I didn't get along probably until I was 17. I just, I hated the work he did and like I hated him. It didn't really all hit me until the day I was walking her down the aisle. Because it seemed like one day I was walking her across the street and then all of a sudden I'm walking her down an aisle. Who gives Samantha Paige Childers to be married to Justin Michael Weary? Be her mother and me. She is like the merchant ship she brings her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. I saw the Dateline segment of Sam when they were taping him at the orphanage in Sudan. And I, I looked at that guy and I thought, if this guy is for real, um, first of all, I want to see if I can help him. Secondly, this would make an amazing motion picture. And can you imagine the awareness it would bring to this guy's work? Is it fair to say that you're a missionary or are you a mercenary? A lot of people call me a Christian mercenary and I will accept it either way. When the, when the Dateline thing first come out in 2005, I sat on my couch with my wife and I watched it and I started crying and I said, oh, people are not gonna call me to ever come to their church again because it showed me walking down the road with a machine gun. The guns part of his story and the battle part of his story is actually the least interesting part of his story. The most interesting part of his story is the man. It took six months of listening to his incredible stories about gunfights and gun battles and bar brawls, you know what I mean, before I could get into the guy, you know what I mean? It took a long time for that. After the movie, it was definitely a period of adjustment for me because I spent a long time in the intensity of, of that role, you know, in a war, fighting to save these kids. Um, very, very impactful, but beautiful as well. We all fought tooth and nail to get this movie made and, and we did it for the kids because I think the kids uh, in some way changed all of us forever. These are just my size here. Any bigger than this here and then I'm tired out already, which I'm tired already. Fascinating to see someone larger than nature like Sam. You know, he, he truly is who he is, you know, whether you like him or not. A mean, violent. He pisses a lot of people off, and a lot of people hate him. Intimidating, relentless. Yeah. FBG, FBG, America, time to slim down. Hey, here we go, guys. You, you can't have someone that's going to be like um, like this sweet, angelic, kind kind of a guy. You have to be rough. You have to be willing to hurt someone. I mean, I understand what you're saying. I just don't do it. Yeah. I don't okay, we should, stop, we should stop doing that then because I, I, I like... Oh, if we... you can't play the game, stop doing it. I can't help if I snap. But I... I, I feel the same. I can't help it if I break bottles. I can't help it if I snap either. I'd love you to break another bottle. <laughs> would you really? Yeah. I don't, maybe I will. break another one in front of me, I'll guarantee you, you'll eat it. He's difficult to himself. He's not just difficult to everybody around him at times. 
He's difficult to his own self. I would go so far to say is sometimes he could be his own worst enemy. Why don't you just run for public office? We're waiting on I mean, you. You would be great they at said, public and, office. And listen, they said we kept this. You have all open. the characteristics that you need to be a, I'm a politician. You, this... I'm like Peter. Oh, you like Peter? Huh? I'm just like Peter. Like Peter Franklin? Yeah. yeah. No, I'm like Peter. Wow. Dave, you love it. Anyway. You'd be home doing nothing. You'd be home in Johnstown or Erie. What kind of life is that? You know what? But instead, you're out here with the machine gun preacher. I'm making you famous, man. Yeah. Wow. I'm here making we go. you famous. There you go. I'm yeah. telling you, you guys are being famous now. It's getting real deep. Someone called him a mercenary, and I, I don't, I, I don't, I guess I understand that term. I don't like that term. He's a freedom fighter, and he fights for freedom. Here, you know how to use that. We have to. It was just recently we were we were on a road where they had a roadblock, and uh, they had two different tribes that were ready to fight. Over 4,000 people was there. They had bows and arrows and, you know, spears, machetes. Some of these people that were drinking started to beat the truck drivers, and immediately my men turned that quick and run to that truck and chased the people off, even fired rounds and the people run and everything. I came here 14 years yeah, ago because crazy. innocent people was dying. And that's why I'm still here fighting. So it doesn't matter to me what tribe they are. Okay, I'm here to protect the innocent people. That's why I'm here. This is a bullshit. This is a bullshit. This is a bullshit, man. What are I gonna do? What are I gonna do? People always talk of those who do something out of the normal. And I'm happy that he dared to do it and didn't listen to the people. You ask President Museveni, you ask many leaders in this area, they admire this man. He's a difficult person. People are always going to love to rag, love to uh, doubt, question. What Sam is guilty of is he's a hell of a storyteller. And yeah, maybe he exaggerates a little bit, you know? In my view, big deal. He's a preacher, you know? If that's the basis for you saying that Sam Childers is a liar or what he does is false, um, then then I say you're not you're not digging deep enough. I saw what he went through when he had to revisit some of the very people he hurt in his bad days, his violent days when he was writing the book. I saw down deep inside, you know, he was remorseful for that. People don't want him to be the real deal, I think, because, because it scares the hell out of them. Down deep inside, I see the heart. And that heart, even though sometimes over the last six, seven years, you know, this other person came out, but I, I would step back and say, but I really know his heart. What 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 do you, what do you need? What do you need? Whatever you want to get. Yeah, but I mean, what what are you are you, are you going to go buy some booze with it or no, what? I don't drink. You don't drink. I think the strong one in all this though is Lynn. She's held all this together, and he is nothing and will be nothing without her. She is a rock. I mean, him and his wife both has been a blessing to me. Both of them have not me out. If I need anything, I know I can go to Sam Fort and he'll help me out, no matter what I need. He 
he's he's not the Sam he's not the Sam that I first met. He's a, a different Sam, and he truly is a, a man of God. He's not fighting for himself. He's fighting for the children that who are suffering. That's it. There is nothing else. I think what I would say about Sam as of right now, that he is God's man for the hour. I want to, I hope whoever hears this word, that the people will act immediately. I preach in America. I go all over the place and I preach. And I see people crying in their seats, weeping in their seats. People promise you this, they promise you that. But what happens to American people is we go home, we turn our light on, we go and sit down, we turn the TV on, and we forget. I'm hoping that you won't forget after you see this. That's it. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done, I will live in days gone by, even if I pay the price of one man's war, at least I You know, is it right to pick up a gun and do whatever you have to do to save us to save someone? Do I believe in prayer? Absolutely. But I'm not going to sit here and pray. I'm going to walk over there with my gun and pray while I shoot. Let your kingdom come. So many people today will not stand up for what's right. And it's like, why? why? What do you have to, uh, to be afraid of if you're standing up for what is right? Deep down inside, everybody wanted to be like Sam. You know, basically, that's really the truth of it. Even though he used a machine gun, he's still Sam to me. I still love him. Mm -hmm. You want to wake up in the morning and dodge bullets like me? Hey, I do it for a living. All you need is Red Bull. Nothing can catch me now. Is that Sam? <laughs> Did I say something wrong? <laughs> had almost 50 pounds on me. Yeah. And then you met me and you're like, damn. Then I met you and I said, wow, I want to look like that guy. And then God told me, you got to be joking. I'll make you look better than that. So here I am. He reaches people that the um, peace activist that, that wants to feed the world will never reach. Thank God for Mother Teresa, but uh, I really thank God for Sam Childers and the work that he's doing.